Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our series on the Acts of the Apostles. Today's our final lecture, and my name is Sister Anna Marie McGuan, and I'm the Catechetical Advisor for the Archdiocese of St. Andrews in Edinburgh. I'm very glad that you're joining me for this final session. So today we're going to look at the final section of the Acts of the Apostles, which is actually quite large, chapters 13 to 28. So obviously, we're only going to be able to skim what's what is contained in these chapters, but this part of the book details what happened, what the apostles did in the third geographical zone to which they were sent, that is to the ends of the earth. So you'll recall that in chapter one, verse eight, our Lord Jesus, before he ascends into heaven, tells the apostles that he wants them to preach in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. He's going to send them to the ends of the earth. And so that that tripartite division is how we read the Acts of the Apostles. It's one of the ways that we read the Acts of the Apostles. And so in this final lecture, we're going to look at that third section to the ends of the earth. So much of the focus of this part of the Acts of the Apostles will be on Paul, especially after chapter 15, which details the Council of Jerusalem. Now, Paul's conversion happens back in chapter 9, and he is now pretty much nonstop in his preaching and teaching and traveling. But before we go into any more detail, let's say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Direct, O Lord, we beseech you, all our actions by your holy inspirations, and carry them on by your gracious assistance, that every prayer and work of ours may begin always from you, and by you be happily ended through Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So, in chapters 13 and 14, which is where we left off, we have the details of Paul and Barnabas going out on their first missionary journey. Now, what is worth pointing out is that this was not their idea. Chapter 13, verse 2 says this, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now, if you've been reading along in the Acts of the Apostles, you know that we've seen this already, that the, that the Holy Spirit is the one in charge, that he is the one who is, who is using the apostles, sending the apostles, that the growth and the spread of the way, which is the way they refer to Christianity, that, that growth and that spread of this missionary movement was under the direction of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, from the very beginning. And so we know the church was founded by Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit given to the church and to individual believers is the one who directs us. So as we see the movement of the church going out and out and out, we know that behind this, behind this, this going forth and this missionary thrust is this breathing forth of the Holy Spirit. Now, I think the apostles, like many of us, if left to ourselves, would kind of stay where we're comfortable and safe. Like we read that in, in, in chapter two of the Acts of the Apostles. They're up in the upper room, they're, they're praying, but they're not going anywhere. And so before Pentecost, that's what it's like. We just want to be safe. We want to be comfortable. But God and the spirit of God who is given to us is constantly pressing us, just like he pressed the apostles, go out, go out, go out. And he tells the apostles, he tells Paul and Barnabas in this case, speak my name to the nations, tell them who I am, tell them what I have done. And that's exactly what they do. It was true for Paul and Barnabas, and it's true for us. That is the mission. So I just want to share with you a map, which might make this helpful as you're reading the Acts of the Apostles. It is, it is uh, very convenient if you have a study Bible or something nearby to look at a map so you can kind of follow along with the action so that you can trace the journeys of Paul uh, on his three missionary journeys and then finally when he goes to Rome. So this map shows you where Paul and Barnabas went from Cyprus up into the region of what's called Galatia. 
So what does this mean? When you read the letter to the Galatians, you know that Paul is writing to people whom he evangelized on his first missionary journey, very, very early on in his ministry. And if you're familiar with the letter to the Galatians, you know that Paul's tone in that letter is quite fiery, that he's quite upset with what's going on with the churches in Galatia. Um, and, it's, and it's early on in his ministry that he evangelized them. And so likely also fairly early on in his letter writing that he addresses them. And so he's dealing with an issue that we're going to see. We've already seen it in Acts 13, and we're going to see it again in Acts 15. Because after Paul and Barnabas arrive, uh, arrive back from their missionary journey, there, there's a problem that shows up. There are some of the brethren who are called Judaizers, and they disagree with what Paul and Barnabas are doing. They disagree with what is being preached. Their problem is that they insist that Gentiles or pagans who come to believe in Jesus must also be circumcised and observe the Mosaic law. So this, mean, this means uh, not just the Ten Commandments, but other Jewish practices like ablution, so ritual purifications, food restrictions, all sorts of things. Um, Paul and Barnabas, in their missionary preaching, did not insist on these practices because the salvation that we receive in Jesus comes from faith and baptism, not from abstaining from certain foods, not from circumcision, not from ritual purifications. Those things had their place. It's not that they're not important. They had their place in the observance of the Mosaic law. But the purpose of the law was to prepare us for Jesus. Jesus has come and has given us the Holy Spirit. And so these preliminary things, these ways that we have been prepared to receive Jesus and the Holy Spirit, these preliminary things have now been superseded. Now, this is the line of reasoning that Paul has. And we've already seen that Peter and his, in his encounter with Cornelius has been told by God that the dietary restrictions, the dietary laws that keep Jews separated from Gentiles uh, have been overcome. So we know we have that in the back of our mind as this conflict arises in Acts chapter 15. And Paul's reasoning is sound based on what we've seen from Peter. Now, this line of reasoning does not sit well with the Jewish believers. So there is a council that's held in Jerusalem with the apostles. And this is really, really important. And it happens in Acts chapter 15. Again, we already know what Peter has seen and experienced because of the, the story of Cornelius and the vision that Peter received. But, but Peter's understanding is then complemented by what Paul and Barnabas had been preaching and what they have seen and what they've done. And Paul and Barnabas bring the gospel to Jerusalem in order to settle this question. They go down in order to meet with the other apostles to find out what is it that we are supposed to do. And it's really, really important that this approbation take place because as Paul himself would say, if he preaches outside of the authority of the church, you could say outside of the communion of the apostles, his striving and his preaching is in vain. Those are the words he uses. He writes this in the letter to the Galatians. Paul, even though he had this profound conversion and this extraordinary encounter with the risen Christ, recognizes himself to be bound to a tradition that is beyond him, but at the same time supports him in what he does. And if he steps outside of that communion, then he, he says, I've run in vain. The things that I have done and the things that I've said don't matter. If he goes outside of that, it's useless. We can think of it this way. The life of the church is the life of the Holy Spirit, who is described as living water. Living water is water that is moving, that is washing, that's cleansing, and of course, quenching thirst. And the life of the Spirit is given to the church in such a way that it's guarded and protected from being lost. If you think of like a river running through a canyon, there's, there's the high walls of the canyon and the river rushes through the canyon precisely because the walls 
keep it in place. They keep the water moving quickly, moving along. And so the water can, can churn and move and flow very quickly. So those guard, those walls, those steep walls of the canyon are like our tradition. They are what keep the living water of the spirit moving in the church. And again, that tradition does not come from us. It comes from Jesus. And the Lord was very clear about this. And the apostles were clear about this. At the end of Matthew's gospel, when Jesus sends out his disciples, he commands them. He says, go make disciples and baptize them teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you, all that I have commanded you. He doesn't tell them, teach them what you think is best. He doesn't say to them, tell them more or less what I told you. No, he wants them to be faithful to what they have received from him and in so doing to pass that along and give every generation after them everything that they need in order to come into communion with Jesus. So everything that they receive from Jesus, they pass on to us. And that is what is at stake. And Paul realizes that. He, if he goes outside of what has been handed down, if he goes outside of the communion with the other apostles, he says it's useless. But if he stays, and if the other apostles with him, preserve and guard and give to the church what Jesus has given to them, then the living water of the Holy Spirit can continue to flow, to carve his path through history, to pour forth into every human heart. And Paul understood this. Peter understood this. They knew that what they had been given to them was not their own. It was God's. They also knew that they exercised their ministry of service in union with the Holy Spirit or not at all. And that comes through loud and clear in the Acts of the Apostles. We see this very obviously in Peter and the others' declaration after the Council of Jerusalem. So there's this discussion about do they have to observe the Mosaic Law or not? And there are arguments on both sides that are sound. And so when the apostles make their decision, this is what they say. There's a letter that is sent with Paul and Barnabas explaining the decision that the Gentile converts will not have to be observing the Mosaic law. They will not have to keep the practices that the Jews keep. And it contains this very important line. It says, it is the decision of the Holy Spirit and us. That is massively important. It is the decision of the Holy Spirit and us. They're not doing anything apart from the movement of the Holy Spirit. But they also recognize that they have been given an authority by God and that they need to exercise it. God is at work in all of this. The apostles are constantly listening to the Holy Spirit. They are constantly looking to the Holy Spirit for guidance, and he gives it to them. He guides the church. So after this uh, meeting in Jerusalem, again, it's called the Council of Jerusalem. It's recorded for us in Acts chapter 15. Then Paul makes two more missionary journeys that we know of. And, and he makes this move into Greece, this very important move into Greece. So again, I'm gonna, <clears throat> I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully you can see this, um, the second map. Hold on just a second. So this is a map of Paul's second missionary journey. So you can see he goes, he goes north from Israel up into, uh, up into what we would call Turkey today and into Galatia, those same churches that he already founded. Then he goes to the northwest and he crosses over into Greece and he travels from northeast all the way to the south, all the way down to Corinth. And then he heads back to Jerusalem. So you can see that he moves now into the Greek speaking world and into what we would call the Hellenist culture, the Hellenistic culture. Um, and we get the story of the Areopagus where Paul stands up in Athens and proclaims to them who this unknown God is that they worship. So you have all these fantastic stories about Paul and, and of course his preaching in Ephesus. 
Um, and the church, we have two letters to the church in Corinth. We have two letters to the, to the church in Thessalonica. We have the letter to the Philippians. So all of these churches that we read about in the Acts of the Apostles are going to be churches that Paul writes to, and we have records of what he says to these churches that he founds. And then he, and then he goes out again on his third missionary journey. And he covers, again, most of the same ground that he did in his second journey, going back visiting the churches he has already founded and strengthening the brethren. Now, if you read the text closely, you'll note that when Paul establishes a church, he places certain people in charge, and, and those are called presbyters or elders, depending on how you translate it. And these ones have the authority over the community. Now, it's worth noting that these men aren't chosen by the community, they're not elected, and they're not self-appointed. It's Paul who chooses who's going to be in charge of this community. And Paul doesn't exercise an authority necessarily over them. He gives them a share in his own. They're chosen by Paul, and they're given the ministry from him. And of course, we still see this in the sacrament of holy orders and the imposition of hands or the laying on of hands where the bishop places his hands upon the man who is going to be ordained to the priesthood. And that is an essential part of the sacrament of holy orders, that there is an imposition or a laying on of hands. And that comes to us directly from these texts in the Acts of the Apostles, where we see how the mission was sustained and how those who were going to be in charge of the churches were appointed. There is a, there is a, a I wouldn't say there's a ceremony because it's not detailed for us, but there's definitely a, a passing on of authority that's symbolized by the laying on of hands. Now, after Paul's third trip, he comes back to Jerusalem and he's arrested pretty quickly. Now, if you've read the Acts of the Apostles, if you've read Paul's letters, you know that he's not a man who compromises. And so when he knows what is true, when he knows what it is that he wants to say, he says it, and that makes him quite a number of enemies, not least among which are the Judaizers whom I mentioned before. Now, uh, Paul is, is, is uh, as we've seen, a very zealous zealous Christian, and he was also a very zealous Jew, and so he was a Pharisee. He tells us that he studied in Jerusalem and that he outdid everyone else in the observance of the law, so he knows he knows Judaism inside and out. There's nobody who can argue with Paul on these points, and so he makes a lot of enemies. Now, he's arrested in Jerusalem, and again, this isn't the first time that Paul has been thrown into prison, but what's interesting is that as Paul has been out on his missionary journeys and as he's been visiting the churches, founding these communi communities, there have been predictions along the way from other believers that this would be the last imprisonment of Paul. And in fact, it is from all the records that we have. The Jews in Jerusalem turn against Paul and they start a riot so that the Roman authorities have to step in. And Paul, even in the midst of that turmoil, takes the opportunity to address the crowds and try to convince them about the truth of Jesus. I mean, he's relentless in his desire to give people the truth of the gospel, even when they want to kill him. The rest, then, of the Acts of the Apostles, so the rest of the books, about chapter 21, 22, until 28, we'll see Paul being transferred from place to place from prison to house arrest, and bearing witness, telling, telling not only what has happened to him on the way, when he was on the way to Damascus, when he encountered the risen Lord, but also about what he's doing, what he's preaching, and why. Um, he bears witness before all sorts of people in authority and in all sorts of different cultures. And because he is a Roman citizen, he appeals to Caesar, meaning that he wants his case to be heard before the Roman authorities. And in order to do this, he is sent to Rome. 
And he receives this word from the Lord, who says to him, take courage. For just as you have borne witness to my cause in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness in Rome. And so Paul does this. He kind of, in a certain sense, he hands himself over to what he know will be a death sentence with the word of the Lord in his heart that he is, he knows what is happening to Paul. The Lord knows. The Lord is sending him to bear witness. And of course, in Greek, the word to bear witness, the word for witness is the word martyr. That's where we get that word in English. So he's asking him, just as you've borne witness to my cause in Jerusalem, so you also must be a martyr in Rome. You've been a martyr in Jerusalem. You'll be a martyr in Rome. Now, I mentioned this in a previous lecture, but just to reiterate, to go to Rome takes you to the center of the empire and therefore to the place where the message can go out to the ends of the earth. It's like the center of a wheel where all the spokes meet. And so if you go to Rome, then you can send out your message on every spoke and it goes to the ends of the earth. It goes to the, the farthest reaches of the empire. And that of course is exactly what happens. I mean, we're still here, aren't we? So that means that Paul and the other apostles fulfilled their mandate. So the Acts of the Apostles ends with Paul still alive, but in Rome under house arrest. And we know by tradition that he's executed by having his head cut off um, outside the walls of the city of Rome. Now, Paul is an extraordinary figure. And so, so looking at him and, and reading this la last part of the Acts of the Apostles, the work that he did for the Lord, the untiring and relentless way that he preached the gospel and did everything he could to, to help people understand what he was trying to say and why it mattered. That might be intimidating for us. So I think it's helpful if, if that's how, if that's kind of your response to it, I think it's helpful to read these texts in, <clears throat> in light of what Paul himself says about all the things that happened to him. So how, what does Paul say about all of the sufferings that he experiences and about the hardships that he endures for the sake of the gospel. The most um, revealing passage in this regard is in the second letter to the Corinthians, where he describes his trials. He describes how hard it is and what he suffered <clears throat> for the sake of the gospel. And in the second letter to the Corinthians, he says this. He says that the Lord visited him during a time of intense trial and said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. What is Paul's response to this? He says in the letter to the Corinthians, second letter to the Corinthians, he says, I will all the more gladly boast of my weakness that the power of Christ may rest upon me. How can we learn? this type of openness? Is it possible for us too to be so available to the Lord that even our weaknesses become places where God can work? And the answer, of course, is yes. But we have to follow the same path of Paul and the other apostles of Peter and James and John and Andrew. Look at what they did. First of all, they followed the Lord. And through their encounter with him, they were changed. They allowed themselves to be forgiven. And think about that. Dwell on that for a second. Peter and the other apostles, the, the band of 12, right? Complete failures, betrayal, cowardice. And even after boasting about how they would be faithful, about how they would stand by the Lord, how they would go up to Jerusalem with him to be, to be executed. Even after that failing him miserably. Paul, the one who wreaked havoc and struck absolute terror in the heart of the early church, who says himself that he stood approving at the execution of Stephen, who was an innocent man. Paul, completely turned around and upside down by the grace of God. And they received the Lord's forgiveness. 
First and foremost, they receive the Lord's forgiveness for their failures, for where they got it wrong. And in, like in Paul's case, like massively wrong, did not see the truth. And so too, we can receive the Lord's forgiveness. We can encounter the Lord. We can receive his forgiveness. And if we can do that, the same thing that happens to them will happen to us. But again, the same things are required that we have faith first and foremost, that we believe in the Lord Jesus, that we believe in his forgiveness and that we open ourselves to it, that we have the humility that this requires. And it does require a lot of humility. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being Peter on the shores of the Sea of Tiberias, the Lord looking at him and saying, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And St. Augustine explains to us, and of course, the other fathers of the church say the same thing, that this is in the same way that Peter had the threefold denial of Christ. So Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? And so each of those denials is undone by Peter's profession of his love for Jesus. But it requires the humility of saying and recognizing three times, I said, I didn't even know you. And that story comes down to us. We still know that story about Peter. It takes that kind of a humility. And then I think we see this in all of the apostles. It takes desire. We have to want to know Jesus. We have to want to be his missionary disciples. We have to want to be sent. We have to want the Holy Spirit to be given the gifts that we need in order to fulfill the mission. And if we have faith, if we have humility, if we have desire, then the stories that we read in the Acts of the Apostles, the life of the early church, can happen again. Their story is our story. Our story is their story. But again, do we have the faith? Do we believe? Do we desire that God can do this work again? Do we desire that God will act through us? like he acted through the apostles. And are we willing and open to say yes? Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. God bless you.